Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance with Maria Marola and Gary Wold, brought to you by DoublePortionInheritance.com. Since 1981, Maria heard the call of Yahuwah to become a watchman to the House of Yisrael and to those within the traditional Christian church. She was instructed to warn them against the false doctrines and pagan traditions of men. After 25 years of studying scripture, the word of Yahuwah came to Maria again in 2007 as she was called out of the corporate world to become a full-time intercessor and prophetic teacher. The name of the ministry, Double Portion Inheritance, was given to her after she received the revelation of the two houses of Israel from Ezekiel 37, 16. The mission of this ministry is to bring together the stick of Judah and the stick of Joseph for the return of the Messiah, Yehushua. And now, Maria Marola. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Today is June 10th, 2023. I'm Maria Marola Wold. Welcome to Double Portion Inheritance Ministries. Today's message is called The Little Horn Arises Out of America. Okay, and before we get started, I'd like to ask you guys to prayerfully consider a one-time donation or a recurring donation to www.paypal.com forward slash paypal me forward slash dpi ministries or venmo.com at maria dash marola. You can also use my email address, double portion inheritance at gmail.com. The Little Horn Arises Out of America. Now, many of you already know that I had this teaching up on YouTube called Will Orange Man Wear the Orange Jumpsuit? I did this teaching like last year. I wrote a blog about it. And the reason why I I knew that Trump was going to end up being indicted because I watched that movie called Megamind like years ago and I started to see the connection. And I truly believe that that movie called Megamind was predictive programming about Trump and show you what it looks like. We've got all our Trump videos at Vimeo. We have it at Rumble as well. And we have it at Odyssey. This right here explains what's going on with the Trump indictments. And a lot of people are perplexed and they're saying, oh, his political career's over. And they're saying, there's no way he's coming back now. Look, it's meant to look like that on purpose. They want you to think that there's no way he can make a comeback. And why they want you to think that is because it says in Revelation 13 that all the world wandered after the beast whose deadly wound was healed. Well, there's no reason to wander after the beast if he doesn't first suffer a deadly wound, right? So, you know, we've often seen a lot of these uh, Christian movies where we think that the deadly wound is like a literal head wound, right? But let's look at this. It says in Revelation 13, 14, the beast is healed, recovers from a deadly wound. But this Greek word for wound means heavy affliction. It means a plague or a public calamity. The word sword in Greek is makira, and and it can mean a literal sword, but it also means judicial punishment. Okay, and it says that the beast will recover from the sword. And so I believe that Trump is going to recover from this judicial punishment And that when he recovers, the whole world will wander after the beast. And that word wonder in in Greek, thalmazo, means to admire. Okay, so this is all being done on purpose to make him look like the persecuted Messiah. Okay, he he's. He's known about this. Look, I'm telling you, this is all pre-scripted. This has been scripted years ago. They told us that they were going to do this in the Megamind movie. And that's why I'm saying to you guys, you got to go watch those videos. If you want to understand what's really going on, go watch this video that we did. We have it on Blogger. We have it, you know, on all our video platforms. You know, and so I highly recommend that one. And also this one right here, the mystery behind the Capitol Dome insurrection tells you a lot about what happened on January 6th. You know, what they were actually doing as far as, you know, occult ritual, because a lot of people don't understand what what went on there. Okay, so I highly recommend that you go and read those. 
Okay, so before we get started, I'm going to pray first. Father Yahuwah, we love you and we praise you. We ask you to pour out your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us. Speak to us by your Ruach HaKodesh. Open the eyes of our understanding. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Okay. I know right now lots of people are saying that Prince Charles is the quote-unquote Antichrist, right? But as I've said so many times before, Scripture tells us there are many anti-Messiahs in the last days, many Antichrists. There's not just one. But as far as the character called the Little Horn in Daniel's prophecy, there's only one. And, uh, you know, the man of sin, the son of perdition that is spoken of in 2 Thessalonians, we'll see how that manifests. But I truly believe that out of all the candidates on the world stage right now, uh, Donald Trump fits the characteristics of the Little Horn better than anybody. All right, so the little horn arises out of America. So in this blog, I will be sharing a few unique characteristics about the end time beast so that you can begin to see that King Charles does not fit the description of the little horn. Now, I'm not saying he's not an anti-Messiah. I'm sure he is. I mean, he's, you know, he's following the agenda of the climate change agenda and all of that. So, of course, he is an anti-Messiah. It doesn't mean he's the one who's going to sit in the temple and declare himself to be Elohim. I don't believe he's the one that Daniel describes as the little horn. So he is definitely one of many anti-messiahs. He's not the one that, you know, that's going to be the world ruler. I don't think he's going to be the world ruler personally. I don't, but we'll see. You know, I could be wrong. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not prophesying this just based on everything in scripture Based on all the evidence so far, Trump looks like the strongest candidate. Okay, so in Daniel, the seventh chapter, Daniel wrote down a dream he had wherein he saw four great beasts, each representing ancient empires of the past. These empires of the past also correlate to the image that was shown to King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream in Daniel 2, 1 through 45. However, these four beasts also represent modern kingdoms since 1929 when papal Rome had its deadly wound healed by Mussolini under the Lateran Treaty. Let's take a look at what these ancient empires are. So in ancient times, the lion symbolized Babylon the Babylonian Empire. The bear symbolized Medo and Persia. And then the leopard with four wings represented the four heads. Um, the four wings and the four heads was Greece. Now, after Alexander the Great conquered these territories, after he died, the territories were divided up, divided up into four territories by his four generals. That's what is meant by the leopard with the four wings and the four heads. And then uh, number four, the diverse beast, the Roman Empire, which is different or diverse from all the others, having seven heads and ten horns. In the second chapter of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream for which Daniel received the interpretation. Daniel explained the vision of the giant image of a man made up of various elements, each of which represent various empires. So these four kingdoms that are represented in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream are as follows. So, um, you know, there's the head of gold, which represents Babylon. There's the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia. There's the brass and hips of thighs. That's Greece. There's the two iron legs, which is Rome. And then there's the 10 toes made of partly of iron and clay. Those would be the 10 European nations that were conquered by Hitler during World War II. But later they became part of the European, I mean, the uh, the United Nations that established, you know, the United States established the United Nations in 1945. So these Ten European nations represented as ten, to ten toes 
are the latter day conquest of Adolf Hitler and Pope Pius the 12th during World War II. Now, following the recovery of a deadly wound to the papal crown in 1929, under the Mussolini, under Mussolini's treaty, there was a revived papal Roman Empire that was formed and they formed an alliance with Germany by signing what's called the Reich's Concordat Act of 1933. Okay, so here's Nebuchadnezzar. He has this dream and he sees a giant image of a man and Daniel gives him the interpretation. Okay. And here is uh, a graphic I made on July 20th, 1933, Pope Pius XII signed the Reich's Concordat Act with which ultimately would place Adolf Hitler into power to, to implement the Holocaust. Okay. And many theologians have assumed that Daniel chapter seven, you know, the dream that Daniel had in chapter seven are the same kingdoms that are shown to Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter two. However, History is known to repeat itself, and prophecy does not stand still in one era of time. You see, our Creator is the one who is, and who was, and who is to come. Revelation 1 8 and Revelation 4 8. So this means that Yahuwah has written history in the past, He is continuing to write history in the present and in the future. So in Daniel 7.22, we are told that the Ancient of Days, which is our Messiah, he returns to earth and allows the saints, the Kodeshim, to possess the kingdoms of this world. The saints are called the Son of Man. So, you know, whenever people talk about the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man, they think the Ancient of Days is the Heavenly Father. But see, Daniel couldn't have seen him. Because the Father's invisible and no man has ever seen the Father at any time. So the fact that Daniel could see the Ancient of Days means that he couldn't have been the Father because the Father's invisible, but the Son is the visible image of the Father. Okay? So the Son is the Father with a visible image. Okay? And so the Ancient of Days is ret returns to earth and allows the saints who are called the son of man, because we, we're we going to become the one new man, right? We're going to become the resurrected one new man. He allows the saints to possess the kingdoms of this world. So this takes place during the reign of the little horn. Therefore, we know that the fourth kingdom of Daniel 7, 24 through 25 isn't speaking of the ancient Roman Empire. You know, I used to think it was talking about the ancient <clears throat> Roman Empire. But see, the fourth kingdom is the United States of America, which is also an extension of the Roman Empire, but as the fourth Reich of Nazi Germany. See, America is going to be the new Rome, the, the new fourth Reich of Nazi Germany. We know that the four great beasts of Daniel 7 resemble the kingdoms and the empires of history from Daniel chapter 2. However, they are like parallel kingdoms that arise after the healing of the deadly wound to the papal crown. Okay, see the papacy suffered a deadly wound in 1798 under Napoleon. Napoleon defeated the papal crown, leaving the Vatican as a church, but no longer recognized as a state religion by the European nations. Okay, but then in 1929, Mussolini gave the papal crown its authority again, recognizing it again as a state religion. Okay, so the deadly wound of the papacy was healed in 1929. Since that time, since that time, the there's been a revived Roman Empire. So the Protestant Reformation was in full swing at the time that the papacy suffered a deadly wound by a sword and did live. That was Revelation 13, 14. I believe the sword of the spirit, which was the King James version of the English Bible going into print, that is what defeated the papal crown for a season. You see, the printing of the English Bible 
dealt a heavy blow to the papacy as many people were finally getting a chance to read the scriptures for themselves following the Dark Ages, wherein the Roman Catholic Church rendered the reading of the scriptures illegal and punishable by death. All during the Dark Ages, people didn't have access to reading a Bible. But then when King James published the English Bible, many Protestants began to see the papacy as the office of anti-Messiah or anti-Christ. So just prior to Napoleon defeating the papal crown, the United States of America had won the Revolutionary War in 1776 and declared her independence from the British crown. But America's independence was short-lived because in 1871, the United States Congress sold off our nation to foreign bankers to help pay off the debts that were incurred by the Civil War. Thus, the modern kingdoms seen in Daniel chapter 7 are as follows. Okay, so here we have the head, we have the image that King Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream in, you know, Jan Daniel chapter 2. And then here's the beast kingdoms that Daniel saw in Daniel chapter 7. Okay, so the lion with the eagle's wings, which is right here. Now, even though this parallels to the Babylonian head of gold, in modern times, the lion with the eagle's wings are Britain and the United States of America. Because, see, Britain uses the lion, but the United States of America uses the eagle's wings. And then... Uh, you know, there's the there's Medo-Persia, which is the head, I mean, the chest and arms of silver. But in modern times, you know, the bear used to represent Medo-Persia, like with the three ribs in its mouth. But in modern times, the bear represents the Soviet Union and its Eastern Bloc satellite states. And then number three is the Leopard. Now, in ancient times, the leopard with four wings and four heads represented Alexander the Great. But after he died, the territories that he conquered were divided up among his four generals. But see, as history repeats itself, the leopard represents Nazi Germany in modern times. And look, this was so unbelievable that after World War II, Germany was divided into four occupied territories belonging to four nations, which are France, Britain, the United States, and Russia, okay? So, you know, these four uh, wings and four heads represent France, Britain, the United States, and Russia, okay? And then we've got the diverse beast, which... You know, in ancient times, the diverse beast was Rome. See the two iron legs? You know, Rome in ancient times was divided up into two parts. There was the Ottoman Empire there, you know, which which entailed all the Muslim nations. And then there was the Holy Roman Empire. That's why there's two iron legs. But in modern times, America is, I believe, the diverse beast. Because in 1945... Under the Yalta Agreement, the United States of America became a mirror image of the Roman Empire, creating the United Nations and thus uniting the seven heads and the ten horns of Europe. Okay, the ten nations that were conquered by Hitler. America established the United Nations in 1945. Okay, so there are three places on earth that sit on seven hills. And they are as follows. The Vatican City sits on seven hills. Washington, D.C. sits on seven hills. And Jerusalem also sits on seven hills. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But see, Daniel 17, 9 tells us that the mother, I don't know, I'm, that's a misprint. I didn't mean to say Daniel. Revelation 17, 9 tells us that the mother harlot religion sits on these seven hills. I discovered that at various times in history, this church-state religion has moved headquarters. The original harlot 
was shown to us in the 23rd chapter of Ezekiel. She was known as two sister harlots, which are Jerusalem and Samaria. However, after the Roman siege in 70 AD, the harlot moved to Rome for approximately 2,000 years. However, in 1871, America became a corporation, no longer a sovereign nation. This means that America became an extension of the Vatican and the Bank of London. Okay, In 1776, the eagle's wings, America, were plucked up from the lion, Britain, but only 95 years later, America became the two horns on the papal Roman beast, as we see in Revelation 13, 11. These two horns are the Democratic and Republican parties, but they also represent a church and state, just like Rome. You see, after World War II, the United States of America became a world superpower in 1945 under the Yalta Agreement. This means that the end time beast, the little horn, must arise out of the eighth kingdom or the eighth empire, which is America, not Britain. The British Empire began to decline after World War II, losing much of its territories. Okay, here is a line by line study of Daniel 7, which will help get, give us an accurate picture of the end time beast. In Daniel 7, 2, Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven strove upon the great sea. Daniel 7, 3 says, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Daniel 7, 4 says the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. In Daniel 7, 5, it says, and behold, another beast, a second like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. Okay, so here's the explanation. The bear is obviously Russia or the USSR. What are the three ribs in its mouth? Well, during the period of its existence, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics was by area the world's largest country. It was also one of the most diverse with more than 100 distinct nationalities living within its borders. The majority of the population, however, was made up of uh, East Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. These groups together made up more than two-thirds of the total population in the late 18, 1980s. The Eastern Bloc members of the USSR are shown in this graphic here. Okay, and you can see this graphic. I'm going to blow it up for you. So these are the Eastern Bloc members. So this darker red color, darker hot pink color are the satellite states right here. The purple is Yugoslavia, which no longer exists. And then USSR aligned with Albania in 1960. And then here's the Soviet Union, right? So... um <clears throat> So the satellite states included Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria. And then the USSR aligned with Yugoslavia right up until 1948. And then right up until 1960, the USSR was uh, aligned with Albania. Now, Daniel 7, 6 says, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. So here's the explanation. Nazi Germany is represented as the leopard in modern times, although in ancient times, the Grecian Empire was represented as the leopard. You see, in ancient times, the wings on the back of the leopard and its four heads represented the four generals of 
Alexander the Great, who took over his conquered territories after he died. These four generals who succeeded Alexander are Antigonus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. In modern times, the four wings on the back of the leopard represent four nations. After the Potsdam Conference in 1945, Germany was divided into four occupied zones, Britain, France, Russia, and the United States. Okay. So in Daniel 7, 7, it says, And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So the explanation is that the fourth beast is the United States of America in the end of days, which has the most powerful military on earth. And it is diverse or different from the other beasts. See, the ten horns on this beast are the United Nations that were formed in 1945 after World War II with America as its leading charter member. Okay, and then... In Daniel 7, 8, it says, I considered the horns and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now pay attention to that. Another little horn in addition to the 10. Before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So explanation, the little horn that came up among the 10 European horns is the United States of America, who was responsible for plucking up by the roots three European nations under President Reagan, thus freeing them from Soviet rule. Okay, so the Ancient of Days returns to Earth. In Daniel 7, 9, this vision that he had, this dream that he had is suddenly interrupted with this vision of the ancient of days. Daniel 7, 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit whose garment was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning fire. Daniel 7, 10, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Daniel seven eleven. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spoke, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Okay, in verse 12, as concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Okay, I'm going to skip down to 717, Daniel 717. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. In verse 18, but the Kadoshim, the saints of the Most High, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. In verse 19, Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. Verse 20, and of the 10 horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spoke very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. So what this is saying is that the beast that has the 10 horns in his head who took down 
three who plucked up three out of those 10 European horns. That's America. America is the little horn. That America's the one who joined the 10 horns after World War II as part of the United Nations. And Reagan, President Reagan, was the one who was instrumental in uprooting these three horns that were under Soviet rule. Okay, so he plucked them up. So we no longer, Czechoslovakia no longer exists. Yugoslavia no longer exists. East Berlin no longer exists since President Reagan. So this is the beast, the little horn, the 11th horn that plucked up by the roots three of those horns that used to be part of the European Union. <clears throat> Daniel 7.21 says, I beheld and the same horn made war with the Kadoshim, the saints, and prevailed against them. So see, the little horn is an individual, but the little horn is also America. America is the little horn, but in the end of days, there's a one individual that's going to rise up out of America. And this individual is given eyes and a mouth that speaks very great things. And his look is more stout than his fellows. And we're going to discuss that. So here's the explanation. The United Nations and the United States will make war against the true followers of our Messiah, and they will prevail against them until the Messiah returns. Daniel 7.22 says, Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the Kodeshim, the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the Kodeshim, the saints, possessed the kingdom. Daniel 7.23 says, Thus he said the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Daniel 7, 24, and the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings. Now, remember, first it said that, that the little horn plucks up three of the ten horns. That was Ronald Reagan who, who, you know, freed Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia and Berlin from Soviet rule. And those nations no longer exist. He plucked them out by the roots. But... Now it's saying that the 10 horns out of this kingdom are 10 kings that shall arise. And then another, which is America. Remember, after World War II, another nation came up, another horn after the 10 horns. After the 10 nations that Hitler conquered in, night, in World War II, America came up as another horn, another horn after the 10. And he shall be diverse. See, this word diverse means different. Now, America is known for her diversity. And even when you look at that word in Hebrew for diverse, it has to do with like a chimera. A chimera is like an animal that is has different, you know, combinations, right? Different from all the others. And, you know, it says that he shall subdue three kings. Well, the word subdue in Hebrew is shafal. And shafal means to put down or to humble. Well, the ten horns are the European nations, as I said, that were conquered by Nazi Germany. And the other horn that arose after World War II is the United States of America. Previously, we read that the little horn America under President Reagan had uprooted three of these European nations. However, this time the little horn subdues three kings rather than uprooting them. And we can be, this is substantiated by the fact that the Hebrew word for plucked up by the roots versus subdued, these are two separate words. 
the two words have very different meanings. The Hebrew word in Daniel 7, 8 for plucked up by the roots is number 6131 and number 6132, which means to exterminate. But the word humble or subdue means to humble. Two separate words. In Daniel 7, 25, it says, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the Kadoshim, the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. Now, you know, previously I used to adhere to the Seventh-day Adventist um, you know, interpretation of this prophecy where, you know, we know that it's the papacy who's changed the Sabbath to Sunday. And we know that it's the papacy, it's Rome that has been instrumental in changing all of our so-called Christian holidays to pagan holidays. So when we read this prophecy and it says, he shall think to change times and laws, we think, oh, that's Rome, right? Right. And I still think it's Rome, but America, once again, is an extension of Rome. And this is what people need to understand. See, remember I showed you at the beginning of this teaching that, uh, you know, Pope Pius signed the Reich's Concordat Act with Hitler. You see, the papacy is usually behind the scenes pulling the puppet strings, but they're not out front doing the dirty work. They usually have some other guy up front doing the dirty work. So the rest of the world doesn't see the Pope getting his hands dirty. They think, oh, he's not involved, but he is involved. So what does he do? He uses a front man to do the dirty work. So all eyes are on Hitler, not realizing the puppet master behind Hitler was the Pope. Okay. And don't think for one minute that that's not going to happen again, because it already is. Every United States president goes to Rome and visits the Pope. And there's a reason for that. Every United States president, which most people don't realize, every United States president is genetically related to King Charlemagne, who was the Pope of the Holy Roman Empire in the year 800. So every U.S. president is an extension of, of the Pope of Rome. He's the front man for the Pope, just like Hitler was the front man for the Pope during World War II. Okay. Now, I do believe that this prophecy about, you know, changing times and laws applies to papal Rome. How many people even realize this? Probably not many. But President Trump signed an executive order in 2020 making it illegal to speak against the one world religion of Pope Francis. Did you guys know that? I'm going to look this up so you can see for yourself. Executive order, the one I'm looking for, is the one from 2020. Executive order... Aha, uh -huh, here it is. President Trump's executive order. And look at what it says. U.S. Embassy to the Holy See. President Trump's executive order on advancing international religious freedom. See, it's under the guise of religious freedom, but it's actually going to do exactly the opposite. See, on June 2nd, President Trump signed an executive order advancing inter national religious freedom. The order defines international religious freedom as a moral and national security imperative um, uh, imperative further solidifying religious freedom as a foundational principle of American foreign policy. Under the order, the United States will prioritize religious freedom in our foreign aid programs and other economic tools to help advance these goals. At President Trump's direction, the State Department will coordinate with USAID to ensure that at least $50 million per year is allocated for programs that advance international religious freedom. 
The full text to the executive order can be found here. You can go and look it up. But the point of this is that it will be illegal, punishable by death, if anybody speaks out against any world religion. We're not going to be allowed to say that it's a sin to bow to a statue of Mary. We're not going to be allowed to say that it's a sin to bow to a statue of Buddha. We're not going to be allowed to say that it's a sin to bow to the image of the beast. So this right here says that he shall think to change times and laws. Yes, it's the papacy, but see, most people don't even understand that President Trump is a graduate of a Jesuit Bible college. And Pope Francis is the first Jesuit in history to become a pope. Both are Jesuits. It looks like they're at odds with each other, but really they're working together. Okay. And now you have our, our government funding religions. Yes. More than one. Exactly. And we're paying for it. We're paying for these abominable religions. Okay. Out of our tax dollars. And I'm sure it'll be hate speech to say anything against them. Exactly. So the final leader of this little horn is the United States president which I believe will be Donald Trump. Now, I know he just got indicted yesterday. I know all about it. But see, what people don't understand is this has all been scripted years ago. He knows about this. He knew about this indictment probably 10 years ago, probably before he even became president. I'm sure he probably even knew about it even before that. It's all part of the game that they play, okay? So... Daniel 7.25 says that the little horn speaks great words and blasphemies against the Most High, which we've already witnessed. We've already seen Trump speaking great words and blasphemies against the Most High. Daniel 7.25 says he shall wear out the saints and that he shall think to change times and laws. Now, here it is. I did put it in the blog. I forgot that I had done that, but it's right here. President Trump's executive order on advancing international religious freedom. Now, he says it's international religious freedom. It's freedom to the religions, but not freedom to the people. See, it's a tricky way to word it because it sounds like he's giving freedom, but it's actually saying the religions are free to express themselves. But we who follow one Elohim named Yahuwah, we're not free to express the truth that there's only one Elohim named Yahuwah. So it's like, you know, the wording makes it sound like that we're going to have religious freedom, but it's actually the opposite. We're not going to be allowed to express our freedom to follow the one true Elohim, Yahuwah. Okay, so <clears throat> you'll notice from this graphic that the four leaders of the four great beasts of the Potsdam Conference, they are Britain, Russia, France, and the United States. Of these four leaders, one of them has a look that is more stout than his fellows. That's in Daniel 7.20. President Trump is not only physically more stout than the others, but he also has the personality of a leader that is more stout. Okay. The Hebrew word for stout is rab, means, it means captain, chief, great, huge, domineering. The dictionary definition of this word stout is bulky in figure, heavy built, corpulent, thick set, fat, bold, brave, dauntless, firm, stubborn, resolute, forceful, and vigorous. Now, as you can see, President Trump commands a domineering presence over the other world leaders. This brings us to the question, what role is King Charles playing on the world stage? Is King Charles uh, one of many anti-Messiah leaders on the world stage? Yes, I do believe he is. But let's take a look at this graphic. Here you have Emmanuel Macron, much shorter than Trump, and he's got his arm on him like, you know, submission, right? And then you've got Putin, who's shorter than Trump. Trump, And, you know, they're doing the handshake, 
you know, Freemasonic handshake. I believe that's the Boaz. And then you got Charles and Trump. Who looks more stout? You tell me. Which of these leaders out of these four nations looks more stout than his fellows? I think the answer is obvious. Okay. Trump is more stout than Macron, than Putin, or Charles. Okay. So is King Charles III the little horn who arises out of the 11th horn described in Daniel 7, 8 and Daniel 7, 24? No. King Charles does not display the characteristics of Daniel's little horn. Now, I mean, he, I'm sure he has some characteristics of an anti-Messiah leader. That doesn't mean he has all of them. But Trump has all of them. Okay, so to learn more, I recommend these other blogs I have comparing Donald Trump to King Charles III, 14 biblical identifiers of the little horn, Trump's Merovingian royal bloodline. See, the little horn must arise out of the eighth world superpower, which is the United States of America, according to Revelation 17, 10 through 11. The Greek word in Revelation 17, 10 for kings is basileus, which simply means a base of power. Therefore, the word is not necessarily speaking of a literal king, but a kingdom or an empire. So the eight kings, empires of Revelation 17, 10 through 11 are as follows. First, we have Egypt, the Egyptian empire spanned over 2,768 years. The Assyrian Empire, 756 years. Babylonian Empire, 299 years. Medo-Persia, 66 years. Greece, 290 years. Imperial and Papal Rome, 1,842 years. The British Empire, only continued for a short space, as it says in Revelation 17, continues a short space. It was only 108 years. The United States of America became a world superpower in 1945 under the Yalta Agreement. See, in 96 AD, in the days when the Apostle Yahukanon John received the revelation on the island of Patmos, the first five empires leading up to the Grecian Empire, they had already fallen. This is indicated by the phrase, five are fallen and one is. Okay, Revelation 17, 10. So you see, these five empires had fallen by the time John received his revelation. The, the revelation was told to him that five are fallen and one is. Well, the empire that was in power at the time that John was on the island of Patmos was Rome. So this is indicated by the phrase, five are fallen and one is, Revelation 17.10. The next empire in line uh, was Rome, which was the sixth empire of history. The seventh empire was said to continue a short space. That's Revelation 17.10. And the British Empire only lasted for 108 years, which is much shorter than previous empires. The only one that was shorter was Medo-Persia. Medo okay, in Revelation 17, 11, we read, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and shall go into perdition. See, America is the eighth kingdom or world superpower since 1945. Therefore, America is of the seven because America used to be part of the British Empire. Okay. You see, the United States of America represents the eagle's wings that were plucked from the lion, Britain and came out of the Seventh Empire after the Revolutionary War in 1776, Daniel 7, 
four. And here's the graphic. Lion with eagle's wings plucked. Great Britain and the United States are the eagle's wings. 1776, the Declaration of Independence. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. Daniel 7, 4. Okay, so the end time beast recovers from a deadly wound. Now, we've already learned that the Roman papacy suffered a deadly wound under Napoleon in 1798, but that wound was healed in 1929 under Mussolini's Lateran Treaty. However, America is a mirror image of ancient Rome, okay? Revelation 13, 14 through 15 tells us that America is the image of the beast. In other words, we're a mirror image of Rome. And the two iron legs of Daniel 2.33. Additionally, it is apparent that prophecy does not stand still in one era of time. You see, there are people who call themselves preterists. The preterism is the idea that all of prophecies in the past, it's all happened in the past. There's nothing... There's no prophecy left to be fulfilled in the future. But see, that's not logical because everything in prophecy is to bring us to the ultimate moment in time when the real Messiah, Yahushua, comes back for his bride. So to, to, you know, make the claim that all of prophecy is in the past and there's nothing in the future is ludicrous because prophecy is constantly marching forward. It's not, it doesn't stand still. Yahuwah is the one who is and who was and who is to come. All of prophecy brings us to Messiah. The ultimate fulfillment is Messiah. Since our creator is the one who is and who was and who is to come, Revelation 1, 4 through 8 and Revelation 4, 8, it stands to reason that the prophecies concerning the beast are also described as the beast that was and is not and yet is. Revelation 17, 8. So the original beast was the ancient kingdom of Nimrod and the land of Shinar. However, the same beast, that's the old serpent called the devil and Satan, who tempted Eve in the garden, would suffer a deadly wound many times in history, but he would find a way to return with each successive empire throughout history. Okay, so going back to this list, you have the Egyptian empire. And then when that was over, then there's the Assyrian empire, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Brit Britain, and United States of America. Each of these empires have had leaders who were possessed by Satan. And so you have the original beast that tempted Eve in the garden that old serpent called the devil and Satan. The Bible says that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, I, I know that there are people out there that claim that Lucifer and Satan are not the per same person. That's false. They There's people out there saying that the serpent in the garden was not the devil. That's false. We are told right here in Scripture that great dragon that was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Revelation 20 verse two, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. Now I know that some people are saying that because King Charles has the dragon on his coat of arms. They're saying that the great dragon is Charles. But guess what? The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says that the great dragon is that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So you can't attach a different meaning to this dragon. 
It's not Charles. That's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. So, this right here is a graphic I made. I already talked about it at the beginning of the teaching, but it's, you know, it's worth repeating. So, in Revelation 13, 14, the beast is healed. He recovers from a deadly wound. Now, a lot of times we want to attach only one meaning to a prophecy or one fulfillment to a prophecy. But I've noticed that prophecy is like an onion. There's like so many different layers to prophecy. We're only looking for one fulfillment in the past and that's and that's the end of it. No, I noticed that prophecy has multiple fulfillments in the past, in the present, and in the future. And not only that, prophecy oftentimes has like a literal fulfillment. And then sometimes it has like a metaphoric or a spiritual fulfillment as well. It's amazing how multidimensional prophecy can be. It can be fulfilled on so many levels. So I believe that, you know, when Napoleon took away the, the authority of the papal government back in 1798, that was one fulfillment of the beast suffering a deadly wound. But America is suffering because of all the stuff that's happening with Trump. As soon as Trump got indicted, our economy started taking a dive. And, you know, and everybody acts like his political career is over. If that's really true, if President Trump's political career is over, then answer me this. Why has it been that for the last seven years, who has dominated the news media? Who is in the news more than anybody. I did a I did a keyword search on Google just yesterday. And it's been confirmed by the Washington Times and by the New York Times that there's not one person who dominates the news media more than Donald Trump. So if his political career is over, they wouldn't even mention him. His name wouldn't even be brought up in the news. But the fact that every single day there's something new to be said about Trump, there's a new happening, there's a new nuance of something that's going on with Trump. Why do you think that is? Okay, because his political career is far from over. They wouldn't even give him the time of day if his political career was over. Trust me. We've heard more about Trump over the last three years than we've heard about Biden, even though Biden is supposedly the president. We hardly hear a peep out of Biden. We hardly hear a peep out of Kamala Harris. I mean, all we hear about is Trump, 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 right? So the fact that that he dominates the news media and all eyes are on Trump is like proof that he's still ruling the roost, okay? And so the fact is that he did suffer a wound back in 2020 when he and his family contracted the you-know-what, and he, you know, it was October of 2020. And so that word wound in Greek is plague, which means plague. So he did contract the plague, but he recovered after three days. And then he was telling everybody in the news that the doctors told him that he had like the most strongest immune system. And, you know, his, his he and his son, Don, were like, you know, talking about him donating plasma and everything, you know, that there's miraculous powers to his immune system and his DNA and so forth. So he did recover from that wound, but I also believe that this wound has another meaning, a secondary meaning. And when we look up that word, it means heavy affliction, a public calamity. Well, we know that that public calamity is obviously the indictments. So it says the beast suffers a deadly wound by a sword and then he lives. Well, that word sword in Greek is makira, and it means judicial punishment. Now, it can mean a knife, okay? It also can mean war. And, you know, the, the root word make, battle, 
controversy, fighting, striving. Well, that's going on. There's war in the court, in the courts, right? There's controversy surrounding all of this indictment stuff. So I believe that Trump is going to recover. And this has all been scripted. This is, didn't, didn't happen in a vacuum. This did not take Trump by surprise. They already told us in the movie Megamind, you know, in 2010, I believe that movie was telling us what's going to happen. Okay. And so, uh, so you can see that this word is more than just a noun. It's a verb that means judicial punishment, war, controversy, fighting, striving, battle. In fact, the word sword of the spirit, as in Ephesians 6, 17, it says to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. Hebrews 4, 2, 4, 12 says, for the word of Elohim is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See, the Greek word makira can also mean a judicial decree declared verbally or in a written document. And Revelation 1.16 says that he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So when Messiah comes back, he's coming back with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. So a sword isn't just a literal physical sword. It can be a decree, a legal document, a, a verbal decree. Okay. And then in Revelation 2.16, it says, repent or else I will come unto you quickly and I will fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 19.15 says, out of his mouth goes, for, goes a sharp sword. So we can see that sword is not just limited to a physical sword. And at this time in history, President Trump looks like he's in deep trouble with the laws of the land, but and it makes it appear as if his chances of returning are slim to none. But that's what they want you to think. Because, see, if it was too easy and everything looked like, ah, he has it in the bag, there's no doubt he's coming back. There's no doubt everybody would, nobody would get all excited about it. But, see, what they want to do is these Illuminati people know how to manipulate the emotions of the people. They know how to get people all worked up. They want everybody to be like, you know, fighting in the streets and rioting, you know, order out of chaos. And the way they do that is they get everybody all, you know, inflamed with anger. Like it's so wrong what they're doing to Trump. And, you know, and they're all these trumped up charges against him, you know, no pun intended, but that's what, that's what they want you to do. They want you to get all like excited about it. And that way, when suddenly all the chargers are dropped against him or suddenly he, you know, comes out of this, it says in scripture, all the world wandered after the beast whose deadly wound was healed. See, nobody would be wandering after the beast if there was no deadly wound, right? They'd be like, yeah, so what? Yeah, yeah, we knew, we knew he would be, we knew that he would win. Yeah, sure, sure. You know, like he had it in the bag. We always knew he was going to win anyway. But see, they got to make it look like, you know, you watch these movies where you're on the edge of your seat and it looks like, you know, the bad guy's winning. You know, you're watching Rocky, like a Rocky movie. And the bad guy's like really beating up Rocky, uh, you know, Balboa, and he's taking a lot of hits. And, you know, it looks like, oh, there's no way he's coming back from this. Oh, and you're on the, you know, you're on the edge of your seat and you're just like, you know, worried that, you know, he's going to be knocked out. And then all of a sudden at the last minute, he gets this, you know, resurgence of energy and he's pow, pow, pow. And he beats the... He beats the enemy, you know, against all odds and the crowd goes wild and everybody jumps up in their seats and, go, you know, everybody's so excited because they thought he was going to lose. And now all of a sudden he won. 
That's what they're doing. So listen, don't be moved by what you see in the news media. Everybody's like, oh, that's it. He's a, he's he's finished. He's how many times do we have to tell you? Trump used to call them fake news. And now, now that he's being, you know, um, indicted, are we so suddenly supposed to act like they're not fake news? You know they're fake news. You know they're told what to report. They're following the agenda of the global elites. They're paid actors. They're all doing what they're told. Okay? So don't be moved. Okay? We have the record of the prophets telling us that the empirical beast is America as well as the individual man called the beast and that he will recover, I believe, from this judicial punishment called the sword. And so to learn more about Trump's arrest and indictments and how they are being used to manipulate the minds of the public, I recommend these blogs, The Terminal, Predicted President Trump's Indictment, President Trump's Indictment, Is He a Persecuted Messiah or a Barabbas Scapegoat? The Mystery Behind the Insurrection at the Capitol Dome, Will Orange Man Wear the Orange Jumpsuit, and Trump's Rise to Power Foretold in Megamind. So now this gives me a chance to talk about the Pride Rainbow versus Yahuwah's Covenant Rainbow. So the Pride Rainbow versus Yahuwah's Covenant Rainbow. So the rainbow of our Creator consists of seven colors, which symbolizes His covenant with the earth and with His creation. The Hebrew word seven, Sheba, also means to take an oath by repeating seven times. However, the gay pride rainbow has one color missing, which is the sixth color called indigo. Incidentally, if you look up the word for proud in Hebrew, it's actually the word gay, proud, haughty, arrogant. Okay, indigo is the same color as sapphire. In Hebrew, it represents the Ten Commandments that were presented to Moshe and the 70 elders on Mount Sinai in Exodus 24, 10 through 12. Shemot, Exodus 24, 12 says, And Yahuwah said unto Moshe, Come up to me under the mount and be there, and I will give you tables of stone. And You look at that word for stone in Hebrew, it's Eben, which is a carbuncle. And I looked up a carbuncle. It says, I will give you a stone, a bent or carbuncle, and a law and commandments, which I have written, that you may teach them. The Hebrew word for stone, a bent, means a blue carbuncle. Now, here is an illustration. This is what a blue carbuncle looks like. And here is what the Ten Commandments looked like. They were written in sapphire stone. You know, a sapphire blue. The Hebrew word is eben. It means a blue carbuncle. So it wasn't like the gray stones we always see in the movies. So Yahuwah formed humanity on the sixth day of creation. And it is the sixth color of the rainbow that is represented as indigo. In Numbers 15.38, in Deuteronomy 22, 12, we are commanded to make tzitzits, fringes, and place them on the four corners of our garments as a reminder of our covenant with Yahuwah. The creatures that are used to make the dye for the fringes are called tekelet. In contrast, the gay pride rainbow has only six colors, which is in rebellion against Elohim because it is missing the indigo, the sapphire blue color which represents the Ten Commandments given on sapphire stones. All six colors of the pride rainbow hold meaning for selfish humanity, but all seven colors of Yahuwah's rainbow reveal his attributes. Many of you know that the woman that had the issue of blood, the gospel says that she grabbed the hem of his garment. But when we look at that word for hem, which is how the English translation says, but the Greek word is kraspadon. Kraspadon 
if you look it up in the Greek concordance, it actually says the four fringes which the Jews wore on the four corner, corners of their garment. That's actually what it says. So the woman grabbed a hold of the tzitzit. She was in quarantine because she had an issue of blood. She was supposed to stay in quarantine outside the camp. But when she grabbed his tzitzit, she was healed. And the scripture tells us that she was had this issue for 12 years and she paid. She, you know, used up all her money and she was not any better. She gave all her money to the doctors and she wasn't healed until she grabbed the hold of his tzitzit. So this is a picture of, you know, the 10 northern tribes that lost sheep coming back to the Torah, coming back to Yehoshua and being restored. Okay, so let's look at the seven colors and what they mean. Okay, so so the red represents the blood of the lamb, which cleanses us from sin. Orange represents the refining fire of Yahuwah. Yellow is the color of gold, which doesn't tarnish or rust. Therefore, it represents eternity. Green represents plant life as well as everlasting life. Okay, in Messiah, uh, blue is number five. It represents heaven. Okay, and uh, six represents uh, heaven and earth. Uh, the first thing that Yahuwah uh, created was heaven and earth. So the sixth color right here is this indigo right here. And then violet is the color of the royal priesthood of Melchizedek because see red is for the priests who offer up the blood sacrifices in the temple while blue is for the kings who rule over the people of Israel with the Torah. Melchizedek is both a king and a priest. We read about that in Hebrews 7, 2, also in Psalm 110, 4. So if he's both a king and a priest, these two colors together Blue and red, you know, blue is for the king and red is for the priest. That forms purple. Purple is the color of the royal priesthood. But see, indigo is the sixth color out of the seven colors. It is a tertiary. That means the third degree, third level of colors. You see, uh, red, yellow, and blue are primary colors. You got red, yellow, and blue. These are primary colors. Secondary colors are orange, green, and purple. Those are secondary colors. But the sixth color is a tertiary color. And you see, our Messiah holds all the attributes of the other six colors within himself. Okay? Uh, in the millennial reign, our Messiah uh, and his bride will serve as we will serve him as kings and priests. We are told in Exodus 19, 6, also in 1 Peter 2, 9 and Revelation 1, 6 and Revelation 5, 10. Now, why has June been selected as Pride Month? Well, the obvious reason is because in the sixth month of the year on the Gregorian calendar, the number six is the number of man. So on May 31st, 2016, Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, made a presidential proclamation that June shall hereby be celebrated in America as LGBT Pride Month. Now that's before they added the Q. Okay. Now when we add all the numbers to this date, um, I just did this myself yesterday, uh, and it adds up to 666. So you got the number five for the fifth month. Then you add three plus one. That's May, you know, May 31st. Then you add two plus one plus six. You don't add zero because there's, it's, you know, doesn't have any value. Well, it comes out to 18. Well, 18 is the product of six plus six plus six. See that? They purposely selected that date to make this presidential po proclamation. See, they're sending out a message that this is all about the number 666. There is another historic event that happened in the month of June. It was when 
Donald Trump was born June 14th, 1946. Donald Trump was born on a blood red moon under a total lunar eclipse. It happened to be exactly 700 days before Israel became a nation on May 14th, 1948. Guess what? The Republicans want to declare June 14th President Donald Trump Day. Okay. Now, all the other presidents that have like, you know, President Lincoln Day or George Washington's birthday. They wait till these people are dead, but these people want to have a day to celebrate Trump while he's still alive. Okay. When Trump was 20 years old, he inherited a fortune of 413 million from his paternal grandmother, Elizabeth Price Trump, who died on June 6, 1966. Now, why is that significant? Well, not only does this date come out to 666, but because, you know, it's the sixth month, the sixth day, 1966. But it also uh, is the date of birth of this guy, this fictitious character named Damien Thorne, who plays the part of the Antichrist in the movie called The Omen. And Damien Thorne, his birthday in the movie is the same day, June 6, 1966, well, where Trump, as a 20-year-old, inherited his fortune on the same date that his grandmother died. In other words, he was born into his inheritance. Okay? And so um, now let's talk about another perversion of the rainbow. The seven Noahide laws, which are outlined in the Jewish Talmud, these are referred to as the rainbow covenant. They actually call this the rainbow covenant. See, the Talmud claims it's a sin for Gentiles to learn the laws of Moses. And the Noahide laws falsely claim that Yahuwah gave Noah seven commandments for the Gentiles, but 10 are to be obeyed by the Yehudim or the Jews. So there's, there's a ban on the divine name since the Babylonian Empire. There's a PDF file you can read. It's by... Nehemiah Gordon, and he says what he says. He says, one of the maladies of modern Judaism is the strict prohibition against uttering the name of the creator. The modern rabbinic law code Mishnah Barura explains it is forbidden uh, to read the glorious and terrible name as it is written. As the sages said, he that pronounces the name as it was written, as it is written, has no portion in the world to Come. Therefore, it must be read as if it were written Adonai, Mishnah Barua 5.2. So in other words, what they do is they allow the spelling to remain in the Bible as is. But whenever they see the yod heh wah instead of pronouncing it as you're supposed to, instead of saying Yahuwah, they make themselves say Adonai instead. Okay. Now, there's nothing wrong with the with the word Adonai. There's many places in Scripture where the where the title Adon or Adonai are there, but to use it as a replacement for his proper name, that's wrong. We are commanded not to add to the Scriptures nor, you know, take away from the Scriptures. And as you know, Nehemiah Gordon says, he says that it already appeared in the third century. In the Mishnah Tractate of the Sanhedrin, it says the following have no portion in the world to come. Abba Saul says one who pronounces the divine name as it is written. Mishnah Sanhedrin 10.1. So what are these Noahide laws? Well, you see, the false Messiah will decapitate those who call upon the name of Yahuwah. Um Hazon, Revelation 20, verse 4 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yahushua, and for the word of Elohim, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Mashiach a thousand years. So the, the Noahide laws are based purely upon man-made tradition of Judaism, not upon Scripture. Scripture is clear that the Torah, the Mosaic law, is to be obeyed by both the stranger 
and the Israelite who is natural born. Shemot, uh, Exodus 12, 49 says, One Torah, one law, shall be to him that is home born and unto the stranger that sojourns among you. In Waikra, Leviticus 24, 22, it says, You shall have one manner of Torah, law, as well uh, for the stranger as for one of your own country. For I am Yahuwah. In Bamidbar, Numbers 15, 16 says, One Torah, one law, one manner shall be for you and for the stranger that sojourns with you. See, the Noahide laws have been growing in popularity. They've even reached the United States Congress. See, the U.S. Congress officially recognized the Noahide laws in legislation that was passed by both houses, Congress and the president of the United States, George Bush, that's George H.W. Bush, indicated in Public Law 102-14, the 102nd Congress, that the United States of America was founded upon the seven universal laws of Noah, and that these laws have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization. They also acknowledge that the seven laws of Noah are the foundation upon which the civilization stands and that recent weakening of these principles threaten the fabric of civilized society and that justified preoccupation in educating the citizens of the U.S. of America and future generations is needed. For this purpose, this public law designated March 26, 1991 as Education Day. Now, sadly, this is not just for the state of Israel or even for the United States, but for the whole world. It says in the Mishnah Torah, Law of Kings 810, this obligation to teach all the peoples of the earth about the laws of Noah is incumbent upon every individual in every era. Now, there's no such thing in the Bible, but they're taking the seven colors of the rainbow and they're extrapolating from that that Noah gave the Gentiles seven laws out of the Ten Commandments. And they're saying that, you know, we Gentiles, of course, those of us who believe in Yahushua, they think we're Gentiles. And they say that we wouldn't be considered Yahudim or Jews unless we converted to Judaism. Okay. And then if we converted and we would have to denounce Yahushua as the Messiah, if we convert, then we're considered Yahudim or Jews. Even though the Apostle Paul says it's by circumcision of the heart, not by joining a man made religion. But they say that if you're Jewish, then you're allowed to keep the Shabbat. Then you're allowed to keep the feasts. But if you're not Jewish, you know, you're not allowed to keep all Ten Commandments. You only have to keep seven of them. They say that, it, that we're allowed to worship idols because we're just filthy Gentiles anyway. That, that the commandment not to bow to graven images doesn't apply to us. They say that the commandment not to you take his name in vain doesn't apply to us. They say that, you know, the, the fourth commandment to keep the Sabbath holy doesn't, doesn't apply to us. Okay. Um, it says here in Deuteronomy uh, 33, 4, and this is, they, you know, they twist the scripture out of its context. It says Gentiles may not be taught the Torah inasmuch as the Jews had their own distinct jurisdiction it would have been unwise to reveal their laws to the Gentiles for such knowledge might have operated against the Jews in their opponents' courts. Hence, the Talmud prohibited the teaching of a Gentile uh, to a Gentile of the Torah, the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. So they use Deuteronomy 33, 4 out of its context. And then in Sanhedrin 59a, uh, it says, our Yohanan says of one such teaching, such a person deserves death. And in parentheses, it says an idiom, idiom used to express indignation. They're claiming it's not literal, but we know that it is. It's like placing an obstacle before the blind. Um, Sanhedrin 59a. 
A Gentile observing the Sabbath deserves death. Sanhedrin 58b. All Gentiles found, found keeping the seventh day Sabbath shall be found guilty of breaking the Noahide law and must be punished to the fullest decapitation. No Gentile shall be permitted to speak Hashem, the name of Yahuwah. All who have blasphemy and are found guilty of breaking the Noahide law shall be punished to the fullest decapitation. So now we know who's going to be doing the beheadings. It's not just Islam. It's the Noahides that are, it says right here in Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the Kodesh ones, the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Elohim and the testimony of Yahushua. So according to Judaism, if a person believes in Messiah Yahushua, they're considered a Gentile and not recognized as a Yahudi, as taught by the Apostle Shaul or Paul in Romans 2, 28 through 29. But see, I, I don't want to, you know, paint all Jews with a broad brush, as some people do, because not every Jew is in agreement with this. There are Orthodox Jews that do not agree with this, okay? Therefore, to believe in the Messiah and to call upon the Heavenly Father's name buys you a ticket to the guillotine. So those people that would say, ah, oh, it's not pronounced, it's not important that we pronounce his name. You know, I've seen a lot of messianics now are, that are starting to call him Hashem. Even some Torah teachers, they're saying they're, they've switched from, you know, they used to call him Yahuwah or Yahweh. And now they're going, they're calling him Hashem. So those who say, oh, the pronunciation isn't that important. Well, if that's true, then why does Satan care enough to kill us over this? Okay, if the pronunciation doesn't matter, then why should the devil care to 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 have us killed? See, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. In 2019, President Trump signed the Noahide laws. He agreed with the Noahide laws, just like every other president before him, starting with uh, it was. Jimmy Carter was the first one. And every successive president since then has signed the affirmation of the Noahide laws. And so you have Antichrist Pope Francis and Antichrist Trump, both are in agreement to decriminalize what the Bible calls an abomination. And we know what that means, don't we? Because if they're going to decriminalize these abominations... That means that if we speak out against it, we're going to be, you know, beheaded. Second Thessalonians 2, 7 says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now, in the King James, it uses the word iniquity. But that word iniquity means without the Torah, without Jewish law is how it's listed in the concordance. But we know what they mean by Jewish law. They mean the Torah. Okay. The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The beast and the false prophet are in agreement. Pope Francis calls laws that criminalize, you know, homosexuality unjust. He calls for worldwide decriminal, decriminalization. Because, you know, in Iran, they kill homosexuals. And, you know, Trump's holding the LGBT flag. And... This was from Breitbart. It says Trump to launch worldwide fight to decriminalize homosexuals. Now, why do they care so much? What does it say in the Torah? Leviticus 18.22, you shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It's an abomination. It is an abomination. Leviticus 20.13 says, if a man lies with mankind as he lies with, with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In Romans 126, it says, For this cause Elohim gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. In Romans 127, Paul says, and likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman 
burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is indecent. Now in the King James, it says unseemingly, but that word is so vague that in modern times, most people don't know what that means unseemingly. So I just looked up the word in Greek and I used a, you know, an equivalent, uh, you know, the actual definition means indecent. And then it says, working that which is indecent and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which is necessary. Okay. And on June 4th, which was just a few days ago, we find out that Israelis are set for the new Jewish temple. That's what it says right here on Yahoo News, on the Al-Aqsa uh, site. So it's coming. It's coming. Okay. Remember, this was in 2016. It says Sanhedrin asks Putin and Trump to build their temple. Now, why Putin and Trump, of all people? Back then, it didn't make sense to me. Now it does, because, see, these two, I believe, are going to form a front against Iran, because I think if they try to build the temple, Iran's going to come against them. But between Trump and Putin, I believe they can stop Iran from interfering with the building of the temple. That's why Trump's image is on the temple coin, because he made Jerusalem the capital city and the U.S. embassy is in Jerusalem now. OK, so to those claiming there's not going to be a temple in Jerusalem during the Great Tribulation, please read the scriptures. Stop ignoring prophecy. There are so many so-called Torah teachers claiming there's not going to be a temple in Jerusalem. They're acting like we're already in the tribulation right now. But see, our Messiah warned us in Matthew 24, 15 through 21, that the great tribulation cannot begin until we see the abomination, the abominable image to the beast in the holy place. Revelation 13, 14 through 15. So I do believe there's going to be a literal image to the beast. It, it might be a clone, you know, a clone of Jesus, you know, an AI, an artificial intelligent thing. Okay. In Matthew, Matthew 24, 15 through 21, he, Yahushua says, for when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place for then shall be great tribulation. Well, some people say, you know, that it's already happened. It's the human body and the poison that was rolled out in 2020. They're saying that that's what the abomination is. Well, yeah, I agree. That is an abomination to the human body. But how are we going to see it? It's not something that we can see. It's not like we're going to go visit millions of people all over the war world and do x-rays on everybody so we can see it. No, this is something everybody's going to see. It's going to be broadcast on television. Everyone's going to see it. And even if you don't have a television, there's going to be, you know, like in some of these big cities, you see these big giant TV screens like in New York City. They look like billboards. It's going to be broadcast all over those kind of things. OK, um, Daniel 8, 11, he says, yay, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of sanctuary was cast down. Now, some people point out that the word sacrifice is italicized in this verse, and it is. But here's the reason why the English translators added the word sacrifice, because the word daily is just one Hebrew word. That Hebrew word is tamid. And guess what tamid means? The regular daily sacrifice. So, some people like to play gotcha and go, oh, see, the word sacrifice isn't there. It's italicized. Yeah, but the reason the English translators added it is because the Hebrew word for daily is tamid, which literally means the regular daily sacrifice. Yeah, our definition has two words where their word is a one word definition. Exactly. With the same definition. Right, exactly. I've seen a few so-called Torah teachers teach this. And they got people confused and like, oh, the word sacrifice isn't in there. See, it's not going to be animal sacrifices. 
And they don't they don't explain what the Hebrew word means. They just trick their followers and their followers don't go and look it up for themselves. It's either clumsy, which is fine. We all make mistakes, right? But it's either clumsy or it's holding back information to push their own narrative. Exactly. So in Daniel 11.31, it says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength. And that word in uh, sanctuary of strength in Hebrew is a stone palace. That's what it says, a stone temple or a stone palace. And shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that makes desolate. In Daniel 12.11, it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. And then in Second Thessalonians two four, Second uh, Thessalonians two four says, "Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim, or that is worshipped, so that he is Elohim, sits in the temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim." Okay, so that word temple in Greek is naos. And when you look it up, it says the two sections of the temple, the holy place and the holy of holies, not including the outer court. And this also aligns with Revelation 11, 2, because it says the court that is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tre- uh, tread underfoot 42 months. And here we're told in Revelation 11, 1, that the malach or the angel uh, is told to measure the temple and the altar and the people that are inside the temple worshiping. So this is obviously not a human body. This is a brick and mortar temple. Okay. And one last thing before we, uh, uh, go to uh, questions and answers is I want to go to Daniel 8. And uh, recently a new video came out by a certain ministry. I'm not going to say the name of the ministry, but the person that made the video is claiming that there's not going to be a temple and that we're already in the tribulation. And this person says, is using this scripture it's Daniel 8, 14, where, and I'll, let me go back a few verses for context. So it says, yea, he magnified himself. This is referring to the little horn. He magnified himself, you know, the, the false Messiah. He magnified himself even to the prince of the host. The prince of the host is Messiah himself. And by him, the daily sacrifice was taken away and... Uh, the place of his sanctuary was cast down and a host was given to him. That means he has an army. A host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spoke, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And here's the key verse I really want to talk about. Daniel 8, 14 says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Well, this person's claiming that this is 2,300 literal days and that this is just under, it's just a little under seven years. So it's like six years and I think, I forget, like six years and some some change, right? But let's look at this in the Hebrew. Look at it in Hebrew. It doesn't say days. See, the Hebrew word for days is yom. Here it just says evening, areb, and morning, boker. So what this means is this is talking about 2,300 sacrifices, 2,300 sacrifices. If there's two of them per day, one in the morning, one in the evening, that's really talking about 1,150 days. So let's take 2,300 days 
Let's divide that by two. And now we have 1,150 days. Now, this prophecy already was partially fulfilled in the past with Antiochus Epiphanes. And we read that the Maccabean revolt lasted approximately three years. It wasn't quite three and a half years. It was a little over three, but not quite three and a half. Now, this is 1,150 days divided by 30 is 38 months, just four months shy of 42 months. So the future false Messiah will reign for 42 months. Now in Daniel 12, you go with me to Daniel chapter 12. Okay. It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. But the fact that these 2,300 days represent six years and some change, no, it does not mean that. The person who's falsely teaching this is claiming we're already in the midst of a so-called seven-year tribulation, okay? But if she, if she would bother to read it in Hebrew, 2,300 days was not translated correctly by the translators. It's 2,300 sacrifices. And since they do two of those a day, we divide this by two. Divided by 360 days, that's 3.19 years. Okay, so it's just a little over three years. This is exactly the length of time that in the days of Antiochus that the temple was defiled. But I believe it's going to be repeated again. But this time I believe that the 1,290 days is the total amount of days that the temple's going to be functioning. So anyway, I just wanted to share that because there are people teaching that there's a seven-year tribulation, which there is not. It's only three and a half years. And they're saying that we're already in the tribulation and we are not. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. You who will bless you and keep you, you who will make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, you who will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. We hope you've enjoyed today's broadcast and that you are encouraged in your walk with Messiah. For more teachings, subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell to be notified of our latest content. Visit Maria's many blogs at doubleportioninheritance.com. That's doubleportioninheritance.com. This ministry is made possible by the prayers and support of listeners like you. To make a donation by PayPal or Venmo.com, Use the email address doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. That's doubleportioninheritance at gmail.com. On behalf of Maria and Gary at Double Portion Inheritance Ministries, may Yahuwah bless you.